My guest this week is Gary Jarman. Gary is a British musician and producer best known as the bassist and vocalist of The Cribs. The Cribs were formed in Wakefield, West Yorkshire in 2001 and are comprised of three brothers, twins Gary and Ryan and younger brother Ross. Across eight LPs, they have had four UK top 10 albums and seven top 40 singles. Considered at one point the biggest cult band in the UK by Q Magazine, they were honored in 2013 with the prestigious Outstanding Contribution to Music Award from the NME. Gary has resided in Portland, Oregon since 2006 with his wife, musician Joanna Bolmy. And it is my great pleasure to welcome the Revolutions Per Movie, Gary Jarman. Hey, Gary. Hey, Chris. How's it going, man? Good. Good to see you. Likewise. I mean, I, feel, I was thinking about it the other the other day, like how um, we used to have such a good community of like um, musicians slash friends in Portland, and like it, it was just bumming me out how like how long it's been since I've actually uh, seen a few of these people. So it's but hard. It's like we were talking about before. Like everyone's just all over the place. It's like you go through periods of like manic activity where you just feel like you're ever going to see your friends ever again. And then you go through phases where you're just like at home, not doing that stuff. But you assume that your friends are all just like up to the next in like, you know, whatever fervent plans that they're making. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah. We need to have a dark night again, though. We need we need to go back to the, the darts night. <laughs> really. Darts. Where, where my first game was my best game and I never played well again. It's like... I, you know, the thing is, like, I'm going to, this is for all you listeners out there who know Chris as the podcast host, but he was a, a very mercurial darts player in his in his day. Like, sometimes he would have <laughs> sheer inspiration and play amazing, and other times he was almost like he'd forgotten, like, how to do it. <laughs> oh, I remember Stephen Malcolmus telling me, hey, you know what, if you put this other foot in front you're going to be closer to the dart board. Like I was <laughs> yeah. doing darts with like my, my close foot, my throwing hand back. It was just so funny. I just didn't think about it. It's what worked either. You were unorthodox. You had your, when, when you were unorthodox, you had your moments of like total inspiration. But um... Well, I think that tends to be a, a a running story with me. Yeah. Especially with my lack of knowledge in the sports. It's actually something that actually kind of, fits in with what we're going to be talking about today in some ways as well so definitely um, yeah you picked an amazing film i love that when i asked you to come up with a film you picked uh, nirvana live tonight sold out and you said i haven't seen it since my teens but i can pretty much replay it in my mind anyway which tends to be a mantra on this podcast people have picked things that are just deep in their soul and uh, I find that really exciting. It was like a, um, I mean, we'll get into it, but like it was a really, really, uh, it's only now in hindsight that I can realize like how pivotal it was in my in my life. And, and I know that sounds a little hyperbolic, but it was really pivotal in my life. And it also, yeah, it's really ingrained. Like I, I watched it yesterday just to get ready for this. And seen it since the 90s sometime but I like I knew exactly where it was going like the whole way through it's like really imprinted in my mind. so the film came out in 94 when when did you first hear Nirvana you you must have been quite young yeah so I was young so I was born in 1980 so I was 13 when Kurt Cobain died um and I hadn't been into Nirvana for very long before that like oh wow um I grew up in, so for the benefit of like the history, like I, I grew up in a, me and my brothers grew up in a small town called Wakefield in the north of England, um, mining town. So very typical of that region, very, uh, work, very working class, um, economically depressed, but um, also like pretty isolated. So, um, so like, we didn't we didn't get any shows obviously back back in 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 those days and and even if we had i would have been too young anyway the closest uh nearby town for for gigs is leeds um and even leeds would get passed over quite a lot um so we didn't so discovering music was something that was like 
there was no there was no rhyme or reason to it. It was all total chance in a lot of ways. And right. all, nowadays, it almost seems like like a telephone game kind of kind of thing. Like where you would hear about it from somebody else, and they would tell you they would try and explain it to you, and you would be yes. like picturing it in your mind, like what could this possibly be? And right. And um, I first heard Nirvana through a. a a friend's older brother had made a compilation tape for his for his brother, and uh, he happened to be my best friend. And he played the tape for me. Before, right, I remember it really well. It was right before a maths lesson. Um, we used to do maths in like a porter cabin at, at my school, um, and I was stood outside waiting for that. And I was listening to it on headphones, and the tape was mainly stuff like. It's heavier stuff like Pantera and Sepultura and um, uh, like Metallica, stuff like that. Um, and so when Nirvana came on, it sounded like it was such a, it was it was so welcome to me because I didn't want to be uncool and not be into any of this stuff. But I wasn't really feeling a lot of it. And then when yeah. Nirvana came on, I was like, oh man, it, it just, it, I was so relieved. I was like, this, this is something really like, uh, poppy and melodic, and um, do you remember what song it was? No, I don't remember exactly. I, I, I want to say that it was in Bloom. It could have been in Bloom, or sure. maybe maybe on a plane. Possibly it was. It was one of the like. I know it wasn't Teen Spirit, and I know it wasn't Polly or like any any of the sort of more uh, or Lithium or Come As You Are. It wasn't one of the, like the sort of like more like um, obvious Nevermind ones, but. Um, so that was the first time I'd heard them. Now, prior to that, like the only music that I'd been into was was Queen. Um, okay. Because, you know, again, as I said, like it was kind of isolated where I grew up. So you only really knew like the big the big bands. And my uncle was really into Queen, and uh, he turned me and my brothers on to it. And so that was that was our only idea of what what music is. Like it was it was literally just Queen. Like you just like, this superheroes who are like sure. you know um bulletproof and like um extremely virtuosic and the only the only concerts to play like you know to tens of thousands of people flocked them and like the songs are like anthemic that was all i knew of music really so getting it so like that 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 was why like my friend had tried to introduce me to like well it's like oh you like rock music so you'll probably like this stuff and like but there's a big jump between queen and sepultura so sure, like, yeah, yeah like yeah. nirvana was like it really was recognizable to me and like and yeah I, that was that was what hooked me in in the first place but it's something i should say about my school actually like i, I went to my school's called harbury comprehensive school um very mixed uh school you know just like uh it's like really crowded like lots of uh like all the different all the different um, villages would like the kids would go there. So like lots of different economic classes and stuff. And for, for whatever reason, Nirvana really, really resonated there. And there was a lot, and you knew the kids who were into them straight away because they looked so different to everyone else, like long hair, clothes from the army stores, right. um, you know, bleach and uh, hair dye and stuff. And so I recognized that in those people before I knew their reason for for dressing like that did they seem american to you did it did it no, seem the, what did nirvana seem american yeah it, well to, not specifically like in the, in those days to me like and music was just like otherworldly in a lot of ways it did it exist right. it existed there was no like regionalism with music as, as, as far as i could see um because as i said i grew up into queen so but then but I wasn't until Nirvana that that I realized it well it wasn't until seeing Life Tonight sold out that I had any inkling that things could operate on a different level from stadium rock shows you know sure. like um I, I was speaking to my brother Ryan about this yesterday because uh you know I wanted to run some of the just see if he had any specific memories cuz we you know we grew up together we listened we shared everything together and he was like yeah, the main thing was that when we first saw Life Tonight sold out, was we we had no idea what live music was. We had no clue. Wow. Like, all we seen was like Queen live at Rio or Queen live at Wembley, and 
And he was like, so it was the first time we'd ever seen like an up close, I'm not going to say unprofessional, but like a punk rock show, something that wasn't like a big production. That's amazing. It sounds so painfully naive now compared to the way that people have access to everything now, but we've just never seen anything like that. And so it was our first experience of that kind of thing. And it's something of a cliche, but when we when we'd been into Queen, we'd we'd, we'd uh, got electric guitars um, for Christmas when we were like eleven years old, like nineteen ninety one maybe. But um, you know, we, we didn't have the patience to learn. To, we just thought like that's what you need to do. You've got to be able to play like Brian May. We had, didn't have the patience to learn that, so we ended up ditching it after a few months. And it wasn't until seeing that it's, again, it, it's going to sound terribly cliche, but seeing seeing Life Tonight sold, sold out, we were like. Oh, like we can actually do this. This is something we can actually do. And literally just dusted off the guitars and and, and started amazing doing it from from there. Really, you know. And and, and I, I know how cliche it is, but it's like no, but there's truth in that. It, yeah, but it's not something that would people would understand now. It would sound like if you were a young person now, that would sound either really quaint or purposely like um, romantic or something. But like, but those things were really true and, and and it goes to what i was saying about my high school for whatever reason like nirvana had a real following there and like and it was a real camaraderie that, that extended across the different school years it's like there's no way that someone who was in year 11 would hang out with someone in year seven but they all knew they, they all knew straight away who the kindred spirits were and right. stuff and and I, I am quite misty eyed about that stuff in, in, in hindsight, you know? No, it's kind of amazing because, you know, over here, they were such a regional band, you know, they were a Northwest band. Yeah. They were on sub pop. And I remember they played in Portland a lot and before, you know, right when their first sub pop single came out and you could kind of take it for granted. Cause you be, I remember going to see Tad, was going to play and Nirvana were going to open. And I went and it said, Tad canceled Nirvana tonight. And I was like, nah, and I walked away because I'd seen, you know, it just was like, oh yeah, Nirvana's playing. Yeah. I'll catch him another time watching this tape. And what, which was funny because this was came out on VHS in 94 and didn't come out on DVD till like 2006. So it was, again, you had to buy the tape. I just had kind of forgotten how, what unlikely heroes they were, you know, and just because at the time it was a total shock that Nirvana was the band that were chosen by the world to break through. And in the film, it does a really good job of showing their confusion with getting big and the giant festivals, like the queen like festivals, all of a sudden they're thrown into but, you know, I think for so long, I hadn't really thought about them being small again, you know, and kind of like things out of their control because so much of it is, oh, they're on the cover of Mojo again this year. And, you know, they've just kind of been built right. up into this classic rock status, you know. It, it's it's funny because like it's, it's almost like the world sees them now how I saw them at the time. Like when, when I when I was a kid. It's funny, like what your experience is with it being a regional thing that happened in your part of the world at at, at the time when you were um, doing that stuff yourself. It's like to me, there were always otherworldly gods, you know. Even though, like, I know that I said I related to them because I could, I was like, oh, I we could do this kind of thing, and like, oh, these guys are like, you could see, you, you know, that they, they were familiar to you almost in that way, but there were still like. By the time I saw Lifetime it sold out, there were there were still gods to me. I mean, it's like I'd I'd never well, I I had the I'd heard them on cassette that my friend had copied for me, and then I, we had Nevermind. We no, in fact, that, so we got we we got Nevermind and we got In Utero. I don't think we had Bleach, but we got Nevermind and In Utero, and we got them for Christmas because um, I had family members who used to buy us. Um, vouchers like gift vouchers for christmas which were for usually for wh smith's which is a stationery shop for like school books and stuff but hmv the music shop they would redeem wh smith vouchers oh wow so me and ryan like we never had any money 
So like when when it was Christmas and we got vouchers, we would redeem our WH Smith vouchers at HMB and buy CDs. Um, so we had Nevermind and In Utero, but we'd never we'd so we'd heard the records and seen the pictures on the sleeves and stuff, but we had no idea really like what we we had no idea what, who they were or how they behaved. So again, right. Uh, Life Tonight sold out again. Again, we got that from HMB with Christmas vouchers. Um, I'd only heard that it was coming out because I used to read Kerrang magazine, and Kerrang magazine said, you know, it, I remember exactly what it said. It said Seattle Gods exposed in new home video. That's what the that's what the Kerrang right. title. And and it mentions how this footage of Kurt Cobain getting punched in the face by a security guard. Right. Um, which sounded extremely int- intriguing, but like I remember, uh, this is what Ryan said to me uh, when I spoke to him yesterday. My brother, he was like, I remember being outraged that somebody would punch Kurt Cobain in the face, like he was like, like a god, you know, like and um, so yeah, we got the we we got it for Christmas, but it wasn't in stock. But they had to put it on back order, or maybe it hadn't been released yet. Oh, that must have been. A long yeah, way. So, so you just had, <laughs> again, you had no idea, and you and you were happy to wait, you know. And then, so when when we got it, I'd I'd never seen how they behaved. I'd never seen how they played, or what scale things were on, or any of that. And it's really cool because like the video opens with um, aneurysm, which I'd never heard aneurysm before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, can you imagine? You've never heard that song before, and you just see that live version. It was just like. Straight away, I was like, "Come!" It was, it was it totally blew me away. You know, I, I I had rock worship too. I had my gods, but I will tell you this: a lot of the footage in the video is shot Halloween Seattle, um, right when Nevermind was blowing up. My band on Sub Pop played with them the night before, October thirtieth, and it was it was Sprinkler, Mud Honey, Nirvana, and they were so damn good it was like what deal with the devil did this band make with all of a sudden these harmonies are kicking in and dave Grohl's their drummer now and i remember they came out with polly and so the album had been out not very long but i was standing next to jonathan pondman from sub pop and you couldn't hear nirvana because everybody was singing at the top of their lungs back to the band which was not something that I had experienced in underground music up to that point. When I went to see Sonic Youth or Husker Du, people weren't singing back to the band. They were just listening and rocking out or in the pit. And I remember Jonathan and myself looking at each other being like, what is going on? Like, this is like Beatlemania. But they really proved themselves. They were so good. They had amazing songs. They also just they were so amazing live and this film really captures this it really shows like a three piece which must have been instrumental in how you guys started creating and your stage presence and having to push all that space with just three bodies on it you know like them in reading and it's like this giant stage and they fill it up masterfully but i felt the same thing i really like they they really became even to me they became a world band. Well, it's it's funny because like your perspective is really interesting to me as well because it's like um, I remember when I first moved to Portland. I came out here two thousand six and I knew it was the Northwest, but I didn't realize how how closely related Seattle and Portland were um, in those days. And it's a little bit embarrassing for me at first because it's like you know I was this younger guy who came out and then I was like. Like when Joanna met when Joanna told me that she she was in Calamity Jane and I was like yes. I, was, I was trying to be cool about it but I was really like holy shit like like it's just it was so weird it was a name that was so familiar to me from being like thirteen or something or when I first met you and we were playing darts and it was like oh Chris is in Sprinkler I'm like yeah Dave Grohl like where's the Sprinkler T-shirt in like the you know in, in some right. of the in some of the photos and stuff and I was like all this stuff that was so familiar to me and I was like. It, in, the reason why I tell that story is not to like you know kiss your ass or anything, but it's like it's it made me realize like it, it's so, such a normal thing for you guys. But to to somebody like me, like 
because of my because of how formative it was for me it's like it never felt like I mean it's never been something that's been part of my world even though I've you know I've met Dave Grohl and Chris Novoselic and I, I've, I've worked with our manager actually Mike Cates he he worked with Nirvana for years so it's like a, you know I, I have met like a lot of people involved in it but it, and but it's it's never ever seemed like anything other than uh yeah, just this legendary sort of sort of thing. But that I, I think, yeah, that's what's cool about the the video. It's like it's not like that at all. It's like it's really it's very warts and all. Um I when I was a kid, I I, I remember like feeling that um it was it was like really surreal to watch it because I didn't I couldn't I couldn't I wasn't used to sort of like collage or or, or whatever sure. sort of movies are like art movies because it is kind of it's almost put together like an art movie but um they have different show like they'll cut through a performance halfway through and it's in a different key in a different location with a different vibe because it was originally a, a piece of work that they that Kurt Cobain conceived and at the beginning of the film they even say like the falling work was you know initially conceived and constructed in 92 and 93 and then they wanted to keep the original intent of it that's something that I remember, like, like that, that yeah, it opens with like a solemn seeming note, just mentioning that, and it's like, it, it was always weird for for my brother and I because like, um, we'd been really into, as, as I'm, I'm going to belabor this point, but we'd been really into Queen, and then Freddie Mercury died, like, like about a year after we got into him, maybe like, or a year after we got talking into them, and we got into Nirvana, and then Kurt Cobain died, and it's like, it was one of them things where. I sort of always in my mind, either subconsciously or consciously, always just recognize that like music must be like uh, the music world must be this sort of dangerous, like an um scary thing to be part of, you know, because it it, it sort of when you're when you're like a between the ages of like eleven and thirteen and like, you know, you you're experiencing these losses of people that you thought were like should be the at the on top of the world it's like it 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 wouldn't say damaged us but it made us like it it made us feel like music was like a a dangerous industry to be involved in and but but that never dissuaded us from wanting to be involved in it it's like it something about that that i wouldn't say was that 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 appealed to us but it it's like we, we priced that in before wanting to get involved with it. like yeah it's going to be dark and like fucked up yeah that makes total sense because i mean did you feel a kinship with nirvana because of you know chris and kurt being from aberdeen such a small town that just like was no one had heard of until nirvana was a known thing you yeah, see at the time i didn't realize that i didn't i didn't i, I just thought they were just famous guys from america like like right. you know for working class kids in England, America was just Hollywood, you know, like that's that's all we thought of. So it's like well, it's famous guys from America, but it's only like when we started to like read more about reading like Come As You Are, the uh, Michael Azrad book or whatever, and reading these other articles, we realized that I'm like, I think we realized that that's why they had such an outsized influence at our school, you know, because right. all those like, disillusioned sort of outcast kids who like dressed like Nirvana and like and uh and used that as like a blueprint for their like adolescence is like it 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 was really noticeable in Wakefield and actually um at my high school shortly after shortly after Life Tonight Sold Out came out, like I, me and me and Ryan formed a band because we as I said we felt like anyone can do it, you know. If, right. And so we formed a band and there was actually quite a few bands formed at our school. And so like we would have gigs at the youth club at the school and there was like there was a ton of bands, like a ton of like um grunge bands at our high school, which just seems so crazy, but it was I, I feel like it was a direct um result of 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 that like that spirit of like it's you know anyone should do it and it's and it's pretty and the other thing was Nirvana songs were really easy to learn with power chords and like yes it made it, it made you feel like 
like you couldn't just we couldn't just learn like you know kill a queen and go out and do a serviceable version of it but you could right. learn a you could learn a pretty serviceable version of like dive or blue or or whatever yeah, and yeah. Like, and, i remember we dive was like a total like okay let's we're sound checking you know let's play yeah. a little bit of dive you know it just the songs also felt really fun to play like I, they're just they feel really good under your fingers you kind of it's kind of fun to learn their you know like where they tend to go to in a song like oh they're leaps well that, that raunchiness in the guitar like you know like all that like pulling off and kind of yeah. like you know like and like and bending and like it that raunchiness was just so like you know when you're a kid that's what you want to be doing you know and like and yeah. it's funny like um this is one of Ryan's mantras, like when we were kids. I remember he came to me so earnestly and he was like, well, guitar lessons are like 10 quid an hour because we were having guitar lessons at the time. It's like guitar lessons are 10 quid an right. hour. But um, I can get a fuzz box for 30 quid. He's like, so so um, when you get a fuzz box, you don't need guitar lessons. <laughs> <laughs> and that so succinctly sums it up. And like, that's yes. what he dropped out and like saved up and he got a fuzz box because he thought like if we get a fuzz box we don't need guitar lessons and it's like it that's it wasn't a joke it wasn't bravado it was like really sincere and it's like i think that ideology just supplanted everything else and it's because it's because we'd seen them do it we'd seen them we'd seen what they were doing on that video and it's like it's a really really great shot and this was something that like it's like again burned into my brain like the there's an early shot. I think it's after the aneurysm footage. It cuts to it's it cuts from this huge show in like Rio, where Kurt's wearing his dress and like and Dave's wearing the bra. The bra and was stuff. that the Calamity Jane show? Calamity Jane played Buenos Aires. Okay, okay. I think, I think that was, I think it was a year before, but the, okay. so it's this huge Rio show, and it cuts from that. And the next shot is like it's Kurt sat in his apartment on top of a practice amp, like just playing, playing his guitar. And like, it's, it, again, that, that really was, it was so, it was so, it resonated with us so much because the sound of his guitar through that practice amp with that crummy distortion on sounded exactly like our guitars through our amazing practice amp. And so it's like, but the juxtaposition between like playing to like 80,000 people in Rio to like being in his, being in his, uh, apartment playing through his practice and people say like, oh yeah there's like it's not a massive it's not the massive unattainable leap that you think it is when you just like because most i think most music documentaries are, are more focused on making aggrandizing the story whereas this was sort yes. of like it went from this grand moment and then juxtaposed it against something so so simple and so humble and it was like that that really resonated with us. I mean, it's I, I'm probably gonna I'm probably gonna sound like I'm like really uh, over egging the cake at times when I talk about it, but it's like it, it's it's hard to it's hard to sort of like um, elucidate like what it what it meant for us, and I didn't even realize it until recently. But like you know, having it on VHS, like, we never had any any money, so like when you buy records or you buy videos, like that was anything that you had. So you were constant, you would just watch it constantly. And like me and Ryan watched um, Life Tonight. So that probably, I mean, close to like every, every night, really like in, in my bedroom. And it's funny. Cause like I look back and I didn't realize this at the time, but like, it was sort of like mental conditioning in some ways, because it's like Nirvana's behavior in that video is not normal behavior. It's destructive. It's like iconoclastic. It's um, radical and like super righteous. So like we watched that so many times that by the time we started gigging, we thought this is what has to happen. Like, you know, has to be stage diving. And, and, and like when you, once you get in the music industry, you've got to be like adversarial and you've got to be like um, making a statement and you've got, and you don't trust anyone. And there's this amazing scene where like they ask Nirvana, like why they trash their gear. And Dave Grohl says, it's a good excuse to not do an encore. And <laughs> now I never, like, I never realized it, but the Cribs have never, ever done encores ever. Like n never won. Wow. And I realized that, 
the reason why is because like hearing that when I was like a kid, it made it seem like it made it seem like Nirvana thought either it was painfully uncool to do an encore or an encore was something you should be trying to get out of. So we just never did. We just like amazing. I didn't tangibly relate those two things. I just realized I'd always grown up with this massive aversion to it. And I think it's because I heard that at such an impressionable age. that I was like, well, if those guys think that you should try and get out of it, then why do it? And like, you know, Janet Weiss has like tried talking me into it before and like explain to me why you do it and like why it makes sense. But we've always had this like inbuilt aversion to it. And, and watching it back the, yesterday, I realized I was like, that's probably, you can probably pinpoint the moment when, where that came from. I think the film is also a pretty amazing snapshot of a band really trying to still control something that is just so larger than them. The film starts even before aneurysm. It starts with, you know, this art institute hey, commercial. Yeah. This guy with slicked hair and a ponytail, and he, it's like, do you want a job in the record or rock and roll industry? Come to the, you know, art institute and you'll learn about booking and management. And, and it's like they put that front and center because at the time, that was kind of, you know, like you talk about, you know, discovering them and, and it seemed big, but they, to us, were kind of breaking these walls down. When they got on Rolling Stone, it was like, shit, a band like us, like a band that likes things we do and is influenced by the same things we were, is on a major publication. Okay, now they're on MTV. Now they're in rotation. Now they're in the top. 40 now they're a number one record it was unfathomable because you just couldn't imagine anyone wanting to like it even in the states i mean i and i get why they were they were such a great combination of hard rock and 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 weirdness and melody and they were mysterious and they were amazing live had great videos but it was still a surprise i mean before them there was definitely you could only go so far so yeah. bands like, you know, who's again, like who's do mission to Burma, meet puppets. Like it was just like, if you were in the college rock thing or the underground, you tended to make three records and then you would implode because you just couldn't go any further. And it was hard to tour and your mental health and, and, you know, having to go back and find a job. I can relate to that too. Cause it's like, it's a similar thing. Like, I mean, we never expected this, but like after, like when, when the Cribs, like we, we put our first record out in 2000, well, we got signed in 2002 and we put our first record out, uh, first album out in 2004. Um, and 2004, we'd made a record. 2005, we put another record out. And then 2006, and, and you get to a certain level, you know, it's like we, we had a couple of singles in the top 40 and we could like tour and like do like, place like the London Astoria and we, you know you get to that level and that was like considered to be like pretty par for the course in this kind of like post strokes kind of environment right but like you know um the Arctic Monkeys who were from just down the road in Sheffield like they became like the they, they put their record at 2006 became the biggest they, the quickest selling debut record of all time and it just blew the doors off it was just like all of a sudden it was like you know um the the parameters were just completely different and like record labels were signing bands just through myspace just like if a band was popular on myspace they would sign them up and it was like oh wow it and it, it's funny because i was thinking about that yesterday when i was watching the doc uh, watching life tonight sold out because there's a cool bit where like kurt's talking about like um how you know it's a trend right now to like try and find like bands like nirvana and he was saying but the true the same thing happened in the 70s with punk and like how you know um record major record he says says major record levels would sign punk bands shortly after their first gig and i remember i was a kid i mean like i was in a punk band i i wanted a record deal i was like i couldn't believe that that was true it seemed so it seemed like such a uh, an exaggeration, but but then yeah, like 2006, I would say it's a, it's a different environment. But like after that, Arctic Monkeys record came out, like bands, local bands, like bands from Sheffield, Wakefield, Leeds, right. anyone with a modern accent and like and and had like some traction on MySpace, they were getting signed without even you know without even playing a show, and like so it's it's funny how the music industry 
you know, didn't really ever change. It was still like that old paradigm, you know? Oh, it was crazy. I remember being on Sub Pop in 1991, 92 was a total trip because there was pre-Nevermind life on Sub Pop and then there was post. And even the label, the way they treated us was completely different. Beforehand, you know, these were... Jonathan and Bruce going taking a, a, a bus down to Portland with sleeping bags and sleeping on my floor and talking about music. Post that, it was like, ooh, this is a nice penthouse I'm visiting you in in this, some strange city. And they're like, let's see your set list. Let's go over it. And, you know, actually at one point saying, you know, long hair's out. You should think about cutting it. You know, and they were definitely playing into the like, we are part of the industry. We know what we did. We were we're big time now. But it was it was uh, really strange to be at work. And then I got to, in 10 minutes, like go outside or find a payphone and call someone at Rolling Stone who wants a quote. Yeah. But it was funny. Innocently, at the time, I really thought, wow, this is going to change everything forever, like in radio and music. Like we're never going to go backwards And then, you know, a few years later, it's like, oh, Backstreet Boys and boy bands came back and, and, you know, pop came back in a way that I thought was going to be destroyed forever. But it was really that was really short lived. Yeah. And 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 when you're in it, you don't think it's ever going to stop, you know, and then like when it does stop, like the um, the reset is like really uh, it's not like a slow reset. It's a hard reset. And it happens quick. And it's like you know again like it's like it's only in hindsight that i realize that like that the the attitude that's like that that is that nirvana have and like and that that we see on that that you see a lot of on life tonight sold out because a lot of it's kind of absurdist it's like or it'll it'll show stuff like it'll show you that it'll be a montage of them winning awards and like people all over the world saying talking about nirvana on like news stuff and like you know, there'll be stuff like Danny Goldberg on like CNN, like like talking shit about like Washington politics, but like then talking about Nirvana, and it'll be like so all this like really like um, you know pretty incredibly mainstream exposure, and they make like this whole collage of it. It's incredible. And it's, and, but it's undercut with like live footage of Scentless Apprentice, and they're just like yeah. tracking stuff, and it's like. That that kind of honestly it worked as a subliminal thing for me and my brothers because it like that we watched it so many times it's like we didn't realize what we were watching. We were too young to really like take in the details, but it's like, yeah, like by the time we got signed and by the time we got in the record industry, it's like we'd been waiting to be able to like break out of Wakefield and make a record and go on tour forever. Sure. We approached it like we just wanted to like we we were so antagonistic towards like everyone that we were with like every every show we would do it be like if you know i mean it was the shows were really destructive and it and it was again because it's like what we what we grown up seeing it was like a lot of people wonder like cuz i've said before in the past that i didn't really listen to brit pop even though i was in i was a teenager at the time that brit pop was at its biggest and most influential and so people find it hard to believe that we didn't listen to that stuff but the reason why we didn't was because it didn't make sense to us when we saw it on TV. It was like everyone would just stand there playing their guitars and the crowd would just there kind of like waving their arms and singing along. And That's we were amazing. like, this isn't what, wait a minute, what, what is this? Like, right. Cause we, we only knew like, yeah, when we were kids, we knew like the, the huge bombast and like, and, and like enormous production of a queen show. All we right. knew, uh, the, the only other, the only alternative to that was the like, Feral, like chaotic, destructive, uh, amazing nature of punk rock, like Nirvana. So it was like, well, it's put on a show. You know what I mean? Like, I could see you watching Oasis and stuff and being like, they're not putting, up, they're not moving any air here. Yeah, it was like when we, we when we would play local, when we play gigs in Wakefield, like, um, like when we were like fourteen, fifteen, like all the youth club bands would play together and like. You go to the shows and like all those kids would mosh for you and and you would mosh for them because it was a good excuse to like, you know, everyone felt like they had a good gig and there was enough people that would catch you when you would jump off the stage and stuff. So like, 
So then when we were doing like local shows, I would be playing shows in Leeds or whatever. And like you'd be on the bill with Brit pop bands and like they weren't like that at all. We we found that I wouldn't say it was antithetical, but it just we just didn't understand that. Like it didn't right. we thought we thought music was supposed to be this like our only experience as gigs was was I say like what we'd watched on Life Tonight sold out. And it was like it was it really was that um formative for us, you know. Like it, it could couldn't have been more nucleic really well if you're devouring negative creep right and you're like 12 so many nirvana songs are like really knuckle dragging strange guttural perverse pieces of rock you know and then it was so amazing when you're like oh he's also an amazing songwriter <laughs> like he knows how to crash into melody it was it was incredible, and I, I loved both sides of that. I liked the noisy part of Nirvana, and I also loved the pop part. And I think yeah. that was also really, really inspirational to me. Well, there's something good about uh, Life Tonight Sold Out. It starts with aneurysm. I'd never heard aneurysm before. As I said, it t totally blew me away. And then the next song is about a girl, and I'd never heard about a girl either. Oh, my God. What a great song. Most perfect pop song. I'm like... 13, as I say, you're still kind of getting your feet wet with it, and you're just like, but aneurysm into about a girl. I mean, it's like, that's just like, it's just so accessible. It was just so accessible. And then it's like juxtaposed with like, yeah, like the the, the in, intense stuff, like Sentence Apprentice, and there's, there's like that shot of like, there's somebody backstage puking. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's like, Again, like, as I said, I always had this idea that the music industry was like dark and dangerous and stuff. And so this like, yeah. I was like, I couldn't believe they were sort of celebrating this guy being sick. I was like, it just felt really like depraved. So the, it also like, it also like gave me that kind of like illicit buzz that you get like when you when you're a teenager and you're looking for something like that. So it just seemed like so jarring that it was like not it like that it was that. It was celebrating the fact that somebody was puking. I just thought was... Yeah. Well, I mean, they they were such a part of like the eighties, you know, transgressive music art scene too, you know. So you'd have, you know, like Carolina Rainbow and Butthole Surfers and you know, yeah. just a lot of bands that were pushing back. And I know that they were, you know, fans of all that stuff. So and you were also in the eighties, you were put on these weird bills where it'd be like some band is playing, you know, grocery carts and trash cans. And then right. it's like a hardcore thrash band. And now it's it's like kind of a weird, dreamy, trippy violin folk thing. And it was like it was really the bills were very diverse. Well, say, like now now I can really understand like why it's edited the way it is. Like I can see this a narrative that runs through it. It's like it starts with like. Yeah, just like almost like this introductory kind of element of like the band, like you know, there's like there's, there's like the a collage, but then it's there's some live stuff, and then it like starts talking about. It shows you like backstage footage, so you get an idea of who they are, and then it goes into like, um, you know, like all the like, as I say, like a collage of all this like massive like mainstream like exposure, and then it goes to them being really fucked up and like an antagonistic. And yeah. then it ends with like you know stuff like Polly and 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 like some, and then they're talking about their philosophy at that point. So there is some kind of like loose narrative to it, which I didn't pick up on at the time. But what you were saying about like noise bands and stuff, it's like that was something that again it was one of the, one of the things that like stuck with me and my brother the most over the years when it, and it, we spoke about this yesterday. It's like how it goes to endless nameless. Like it goes to footage of them playing endless nameless. And I I'd never heard noise music at that point. I, I'd never heard Sonic Youth. Right. I didn't even know what Sonic Youth were. I didn't I didn't know what noise music was. But there was something about we we always look forward to it getting to the endless nameless section because it this yeah. and I guess it's because it's the first time I'd ever heard any anything that could fall under that category of noise music. And it's and it's like really surreal. It's like it's got, you know all this like improvised sort of like aggressive stuff and then it goes to that that really pretty kind of section where he's like yeah. singing summer summer and it's like it's so cool and like 
but I'd never heard the song before that. I didn't even know that that song existed. I just thought it was just like a... Because right. on, on the video box, it just says noise jam or something like that. It doesn't <laughs> say the name. It's the first bit of noise jam. But then that... Um, me and Rai, like, we discovered it on the... Because it's the hidden track on the Nevermind CD. Right. But we didn't know that. We were like... So we were... Uh, we used to listen to our CDs when we were playing video games. So... um We'd been listening to Nevermind, and then my granddad came over, and I got a golf video game because he'd asked me to get one. Like, oh, he mentioned like something about a golf video game, so he put this golf game on for him, and forgot that Nevermind was running. And then all of a sudden, like, it just uh, <laughs> and this name was that we had we had no idea how we'd accessed it or what had happened, but we recognized it as being the song from uh, from from Life Tonight Sold Out, but. We didn't even know there was a studio version for it, so it was, so yeah. it was like, yeah, it, it, Kurt's trick worked. I wanted to ask you some parallel questions um, in terms of your life and music. Yeah, and this video seems like Nirvana had a very antagonistic relationship with press, although they do it like they're sitting there talking. They're kind of bored. They're checked out. They've been asked the same things, you know. When they, I think at one point they're asked, like, could you describe your music? And they start going like, boom, 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 boom. you know, like they're just, they're kind of like patiently taking the piss out of people. What was your experience like all of a sudden having people want to know about you and, and kind of, you know, weave their way into your life? Well, I think like for, for those guys, they, they were just having to deal with like just enormous amounts of press. So they were probably really bored. I mean, like for, for us, like we were, we always had a good relationship with people who who understood us. Like the, the you know the enemy was the paper of note at the time, and like and they they were always like really, they seemed like they understood what we were about. They 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 championed that that side of us, the fact that we were, um, you know, kind of going against the grain in that way. Like they 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 celebrated that, so that that was always easy. Like it 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 got challenging like post. 2006 when like things were a lot more mainstream in general so like you it was mainly to do with like um tabloid newspapers and tv appearances they were the places that were like like the music press was generally fine but like the um if you'd be on it sometimes you'd be on tv shows where it'd be like it just you shouldn't be there you just feel like you like it, it just felt like it, it's such a straight world. You don't realize it until you get there. It's such a straight world, and like so, some of that would would be jarring. But like, and then like the tabloids, like I mean, the tabloids actually wrote about my brother and his relationship quite a lot. And then like, and then right. his sort of like craziness or whatever. And it was like looking back, that was I. I actually I can't. I, I actually can't believe we ended up in that situation. That's something that was like. um I think it's damaging long term and we didn't really know necessarily know how to deal with it. But um, you know, what I'm saying about the TV, so it's like there's the the footage of uh Nirvana playing on the Jonathan Ross show. Yeah. Yeah. Which is like which is great footage because it's like Jonathan Ross was like the that TV show. I mean, it's still on now actually, but like it was very much like classic sort of like just light entertainment beamed into you in room and so and so like when that when it comes on on the on the uh on live tonight sold out it's it was instantly familiar to us but we'd never seen the we'd never seen the nirvana appearance on there so it's this instantly familiar thing that you associate with just like straight mainstream tv and then this amazing like sort of subversive act and it's like i i realize myself like having been in not that situation but situations similar to it like you think it would be easy to pull that off, but it's really not. Like the, there's right. there's so much pressure to like, even just like doing stuff like Jules Holland or like uh, or like David Letterman and and stuff. Like when I was a kid, I was always like, oh, if I was in that situation, I'd just like, you know, right. do something ridiculous. But like the, the pressure to perform is actually like really, uh, really tangible, and so like it it makes it all the more stark that they they just went ahead and did that and like yeah. and even the top of the pops performance it's like that's like legendary now like nirvana playing pops and like and what they did yeah they basically if people haven't seen it they kurt cobain 
does like a really low, like kind of Morrissey at times. I mean, it's, it's, it's clearly mo- the, the mocking the fact that like Top of the Pops makes you mime. And so yeah. Dave and Chris mime in a way that's really obvious that they're not playing. And Kurt, <laughs> you're allowed to do a live vocal, but he clearly doesn't like. Um... Put the lights out, it's less dangerous. And, it, and th- that was that was like something that was, you know, that was very i mean it's legendary now but like but like me and my friends when we were at school we would all like you know fantasize like oh what would you do if you were in that situation you got because now we're all like we wouldn't do top of the pops we wouldn't play the ball we'd we'd, you know we'd we'd do something ridiculous like nirvana did and like we could like we could never think of anything we actually got i mean it's a big regret now actually but we actually got offered top of the pops twice and we turned it down both times we thought that was like the punk rock thing to do or whatever, you know. Now I really regret it. I'm like, right. Like, it's like Ryan says, he's like, it's not like anyone gives you an award for like turning down on top of the pops. It's not, it's like no one cares now. Like, people, right. people at the time, people might, might have thought it was kind of funny, but no one knows, you know, nobody, nobody knows that we turned down top of the pops. We could have right. done, so, could have done something, I guess, but yeah. What would you have done? Do you, what do you think you would have done? Uh, when we were kids, the idea used to always be that you'd just like, you know, trade, you'd just swap instruments so they didn't know who was who because we were twins, you know, like, but again, it's too subtle that it doesn't really make any difference. We actually, we did Jules Holland and there's this, they do this thing where like everyone has to, at the start, everyone has to jam on like a blues scale or something. <laughs> like, you know, with, with all due respect, like it yeah. just seems really like not, not something we want to do. So we we figured that they didn't know who we were. So like we we did switch instruments for that. So my, my kid brother Ross was on guitar and he can't play guitar at all. And like I was playing drums. So that was our like little nod to that. But again, it's so subtle that no one else would even really think this, you know. What about the the concept of this was a big deal and I don't even think it exists anymore, but I'm curious if it existed when you were starting to make records, but the concept of selling out. Yeah. Like Nirvana and Sonic Youth going to a major label and Husker Du and the replacements, those were like big deals to the underground. It doesn't even seem like a conversation like you could sell out anymore. But at the time, did you guys ever have to deal with your audience being like, oh, they switched labels and, you know? No, well, we we actually completely screwed ourselves in that. Like, like we we'd conditioned ourselves like so much through the teachings of, of life tonight sold out that we, when it came down to the crunch, we actually screwed ourselves instead of like, uh, we, we, so I'll, I'll explain. Um, after the second album, um, the second album, like the singles all went into the top 40 and we'd done that on a, on an independent record label. And so a bunch of major labels tried signing us, um, all three of the, of the big major labels were trying to sign us. Um, one was uh, Interscope, and they were doing a deal with uh, MySpace at the time, and they they were trying to sign us. And there was also Sony and Warner Brothers, but we so we used the leverage that we had. Like we turned down the MySpace thing, which was cra- which was so crazy at the time because that that was a lot of money. But like regardless, like. We turned that down, but then we got... So we, the reason why we signed to Warner Brothers was because we used the leverage that we had to say, okay, we'll sign with you, but you need to include Wichita, who was the indie label that we were signed to. You need to include them in the deal, which, look, if you know anything about music industry and record deals, we were massively shooting ourselves in the foot by doing that because instead of like instead of selling out for want of a better phrase, instead of selling out and getting and taking the money and signing to a major label, we made Warner Brothers sign Wichita essentially, mm. uh, which it's totally foolish because it, 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 it undermines Warner's position. Like they don't necessarily want to like work the record in the same way because like somebody else has still got rights on it. Okay. Like party has got rights on it and it screws us because we had to, basically pay a load of money to Wichita that was on offer to us. So like, but that was because we were like keeping it real. We didn't want to sell out. We wanted right. to like, we want, and in hindsight, 
we should have just done we should have just done the deal we thought like it was a purism thing we thought that like right that was how we uh, threaded the needle of not selling out because we didn't want people to think we were sellouts but in the cold light of like 2023 Hey, nobody cares about selling out like that. <laughs> the modern in the modern age, that's is like the worrying about selling out is actually sneered at. It's like you're seen as like being like, you know, selling out is like is something to be proud of now. It's like it's like a brand thing, you know. Yeah. So, so that seems absurd. But also knowing now what I know about the music industry, like we, like the last couple of years, like I, I went on like a long sort of legal crusade to get our rights back to our records right. and if i'd have known then what i knew now there's no way that i would have like right. pledged loyalty to an independent label that that, that is that is not a two-way street let's just put it that way right. so um yeah we we would it, we were concerned about it and we we're concerned about it to the degree where we we operated massively outside of our best interests and right. um and you know caused a caused a pretty big conflict of interest really right so it was again we just we'd mentally conditioned ourselves really like it's we don't you know watching lifetime sell out every night for like two <laughs> years it's like, it's, no yeah. well and, and and now you're reissuing your early records and yeah. you know it's 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 really feels good it all it all worked out but it's like you know if i'd have known then I yeah. just thought it, like the ultimate anathema was to to do that sellout, but like totally, we were in a position where we could basically like use our leverage to like get get the you know the people who were, who were caught in us to like sort of dance to our tune a little bit, and we massively squandered it by by like using it to to have them like essentially just look after our former label, which is you know right. No, it's kind of amazing. I do definitely see like I can picture the you know, osmosis of that Nirvana experience with all of you discovering it and learning from it, basically. My my feelings have like totally softened over time, but like back then it was like it was we were we were pretty hardline and we were we were pretty, you know, like we learned a lot of our um ethics from we we used it as like a, a an ethical guidebook almost like like the teachings of Nirvana, you know, and it's and and you know, in in, in most circumstances it served as well actually. Sure. But um but in, in that particular circumstance we you know we sort of uh yeah we we worked against ourselves but um well what about some of the other things that I've noticed when I was thinking about you watching this film? You've played to giant audiences in your life you know you've played these festivals and i've never done that what does that feel like is it is that fun or is it or do you prefer something more intimate yeah no it's 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 amazing like um like first time we played reading festival was a big thing for us because again it was like you know it's so synonymous with nirvana and i when i when when i first watched uh lifetime sold out it mentions that some of it's at reading festival now we i didn't know what reading festival was i i knew where reading was so i was like oh wow i was I was just picturing, picturing like a local fair. I was like, why would why would they be in a local fair? It's incredible. Uh, yeah, so me and Ryan went to Reading in '97, uh, which is you know three years after Kurt died. But like that, we were 17, 16 years old when we went to Reading for the first time. Like right after we did our GCSEs, and like it was almost like a pilgrimage. So, but getting to play that first time we first time we played it on the main stage was two thousand six. And we really felt the gravity of that because, you know, I that's something I dreamt about since I was 13. Amazing. You know? Like I, I could I could really feel like I was walking in those sort of footsteps that I'd wanted to since I was 13. So it's like what happened was like the day we were playing it, we we were pretty old hands at like festivals and gigs at that point. We we're pretty battle hardened. But before that gig, all this stuff just came back to me. It's like, yeah, all that stuff from being a 13 year old who was like dreaming about this, like, and we would sit in our bedroom and watch these videos and like fantasize about it. All of that stored up and pent up, um, right. like, you know, uh, teenage uh, idealism, just like the dam broke like the night before, like when we were just like, it just all hit us like really hard and like it, it, it that's a, it's a really amazing feeling but it's also like 
we were nervous by the time we were going out to do that show. You right, know? Right. And, so once we, once we, and we did Reading first, because now they do Reading and Leeds, but we did Reading first. And I remember when we came off, like that was the best feeling because we'd had a really good show. And and we'd also like climbed an, a, a Mount Everest of sorts because it was like when we were kids and we set that goal, that was like an unattainable goal. So I remember that just being the greatest feeling afterwards, like relief mixed with like, that surreal sense of achievement but but i don't remember the show at all like the show like i was functioning purely on animal instinct so and i've we've been the main stage a couple of times after that we did we've done it like three or four times i think and it was like it ne- that never loses its sense of gravity it's like it's a different reality like we've done we've done like big uh outdoor shows at glastonbury as well which which is a bigger audience but Reading feels a lot heavier, and I didn't have that same feeling doing Glastonbury. Interesting. But actually, when we we did some shows with uh, Foo Fighters, we've done a few shows with Foo Fighters, and one of them was a um, was a uh, Manchester Etihad Stadium. Uh, first time we'd ever played a stadium, and to be doing a show of that scale with Dave Grohl <laughs> being there, amazing. So uh, that was just like that's something that it's kind of hard to uh comprehend in a lot of ways and like and then like afterwards like hanging out with dave and and pat smear and like and dave that that dave invited us to make a record at his studio you know which we which we, we did we made our eighth album at dave's studio and like right to get to like just to get to know those guys or like live in their world for a little bit. It's like, honestly, it doesn't, like, I might have been doing this 20 years, but that that stuff doesn't, it's never lost on us, you know? And and, and again, it's because like all this, like this movie that we're talking about, it was, it was, it, was, it formed so much of our interest in wanting to do it and how we approach things when we did get to do it, you know? So I think you're a lot like me, like it just music, it just, it shatters me still. And it shattered me at a a young age. And I even remember when I saw Nirvana play on the In Utero tour, I remember myself and my wife at one point separately, not knowing, but we were like crying because it was so overwhelming they have somebody from the germs in their band. It's like, it was just so, it, it was great. And I feel like also at the same time, you know, in the underground, it, there were people starting to be like, oh, Nirvana, like, yeah, there's sellouts. Oh, they recorded with Steve Albini and then they went back and remixed it. And it's like, well, you know what? Listen to those records. They're still weird as fuck. Yeah. And the fact that it found an audience at all and sold millions is still unfathomable nothing like that will ever happen again you know and it's as i say like living out here in portland i have to restrain myself from like asking like too many nerdy questions of all you guys you know because like you know getting to live it like that like the context that you guys have is like so different from mine but like but even so like yeah going back and watching it yesterday i i get quite emotional about it and but my emotions are a different one it's like it's the fact that like it's so pure, like the. I mean, it's a really pure movie for one thing, but but yeah. the, the the relationship that I have with it is so pure because it remind all it reminds me of is like me and Ryan we would watch it every night. It's all we had, like it led to every friendship we had through our teenage years, like being outsiders. It led us to like play music. It it made it okay for us to play music. That was the main thing. It led to us like having a, a local punk rock community, like, and then, and then, and then, as I say, like, it informed our behavior when when we finally got into that situation ourselves. And like, so I watch it, and it's like it's so in my DNA, like in a lot of ways that like I I know that I know I'm aware that I sound really cheesy saying this stuff, but it's like. I just I, before before seeing it, I had no clue what any of this was. Like any of it, it was it was like, it was like my, my total entryway into like everything that's defined my life ever since. You know, and it, there's some funny things like there's a bit where they're loading the van yes. and like the same. Who's the 
goddamn stupid song <laughs> that they're rearranging. You know? And this, and this comes to the conclusion like it's Russell. Russell did it. Now Russell, the the Russell they're referring to is their agent Russell Warby, who's actually the Cribs agent now. <laughs> It's funny because he was like a junior agent at the time, but now he's like, a, you know, a, a, it's the head of William Morris. But like, it's funny, like the first time that, not the first time, but one of the times that when we would meet him, uh, we'd always be like just drinking backstage. And Rye would always go up to him like, who's a stupid goddamn son of a bitch? <laughs> but but Russell, Russell never knew what he was referring to. Oh my and, God, that's hilarious. Like, incre- like you know, like, incredibly influential like agent and he's just like why is this guy like just constantly like ragging why do you rag on me every time he sees me like this it's no like like what's it all about but uh. but it's only, it only like years later that we were like we, we were referring to life tonight sold out and he's like oh i i had no idea i didn't i didn't, I didn't get the reference he just uh. thought we were just like shit what about in the film i was curious about you know your songwriting at one point they're talking to the band and, and Kurt says, it's music first, lyrics second. He's like, he's just definite about that. How about you? How do you go about writing your stuff? Oh, totally music first, lyrics second. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm finishing. Like, so like we've got like, we've been doing, a, well, we've been writing songs. And it's like, I the lyrics always come second because it's yeah. like. Me too. It's the same. <laughs> You engage different sides of your brain, I think. I mean, sometimes when you write in, you'll just sing lyrics and it'll work. And which is, as I suspect, that's kind of what Kurt did sometimes. But then, like, flesh them out properly later. Some, so, so, like, sometimes it works. It just, like, you know, the, the phonetic sounds that you're making, like, make the songs. But, but like, proper song, like, like, writing proper verses and proper lyrics, it's like, it engages a totally different part of the brain for me. Yeah. I mean, back in the day, like I used to just do it all spontaneous, but like now it's more considered and I can't, I can't do the two things at the same time. Have you ever done a show? Like there's that great point where he's tuning up for come as you are. And then yeah. you just, he starts it and you just immediately know this is fucked. This is so out of tune, but they start in and the rest of them don't know he's so off and he just leans into it and he's just goofy scream. Do you ever like just at some point just through exhaustion or whatever, just kind of like go like, okay, okay, this is, this song's going off the rails here. I think there's a great uh, nobility in sabotaging yourself rather than like <laughs> fighting against something that's in, an impossible situation and we used to do it like we played like v festival and it'd be like you know mainstream kind of like pop festival but like you know guitar bands were on the radio at that point so we got booked for places like that and you'd go on and be like you knew you were you knew it wasn't gonna work so you'd just be like all right like cool like let's just uh <laughs> Let's just start trashing the gear now, and like, let's just start like let's start the noise workout. And like, I'm glad. Like, yeah, there's we there's I think there's a certain nobility in self sabotage. I think it's like, I think it's much more radical than like trying to play along. Oh, the worst thing you can do is get your feelings hurt and be like, oh, why does no one like my songs? That's the worst thing that you can do. Right. But the best thing to do in that situation is that you either like own it and like just just get on with it, or you just like, all right, cool, like like. We're not supposed to be here. Let's just uh let you know, let's indulge ourselves. And yeah. we 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 did we did get to do that a few times. I mean, there's nothing there's nothing quite like alienating thirty thousand people all at once. It's it's an, an amazing experience. But like but one thing I'll say about that come as you are thing though, it's like he he's sabotaging it and like singing really bad, but his voice sounds incredible on that. Like like he's just screaming that that chorus, but it sounds it's almost like it highlights why his voice is so good. It's like yeah. it, like when it when you listen to more feral like that, you realize like how unique it is. It just it sounds really cool on it sounds easy to scream like that, but that's paradoxical because screaming is supposed to be a tortured, like, you know, desperate act. But when someone's doing it so like effortlessly you just like just so striking you know like it, 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 yeah it, it just takes me back to being a teenager in a lot of ways like when as soon as i hear yeah. it and i love the footage of him crawling off stage at the end after you know endless nameless just the slow movement of just being like we're done it's a really profound shot like it's really out 
and like because like you couldn't set something like that up like it's it's really artfully done and not and like unintentionally so it's like it's like playing the cheapest looking crappy guitar like it's, it's, it's on like one of those unibox guitars it looks so cheap like a total plank you know and like and there's a, a huge sea of an audience behind him and he's just playing as if he doesn't know how to play guitar you know again it's relatable. It's great it's so relatable and then and then the last shot he, he literally crawl it's it's really it's really profound he, like he, he literally crawls out of the spotlight and that's how it ends and then the credits roll and i, I remember as a kid like the, the movie starts with that solemn intro, like that note about like, you know, yeah. it, said, it doesn't say that Kurt died, but it's it, essentially like that's the implication. And then it ends with him crawling out of the spotlight into the dark. And I was like, I, I was always just really struck by it. And and one of the sad things is, um, again, in the little pamphlet that comes with it, we would look at it and like that, that show is actually chronologically the latest show in the, in the thing. So it would make you feel sad, like, oh, that's how it ended up. There was no, you know, we, we were reading too much into it, probably. But yeah. that's the show where he's struggling the most, and it's the show where it ends yes. in such a, like, in such a sort of sad manner. Yeah, it's quite powerful. Yeah. Um, I Again, rewatching it just really brought me back to how funny and unique and how rebellious and they were put in such an unlikely space to be so successful and obviously they really looked up to rem who did a really amazing job also navigating and being popular but it was really unknown and the fact that they used it to do it the just their own way without having any experience in it or anyone to compare themselves to they were really alone it's i think it's masterful and i think the way that the film, like you mentioned, has collage in it. And at that point when there's a five minute part where it's just, it, it's starting to eat itself. Things yeah. are starting to repeat over yeah. and over again. And, you know, they're going like weird behavior and allegedly yeah. wasted lifestyle over and over again. And they're leaning into just the, the mania of what they were in. Cause they do, it, it seems exhausting. Like there's a there's a bit of an exhaustion to the film, too, of them kind of being like, we just like we're in this machine and we're trying to fight against it. Yeah. And and it's a losing battle. Like people are going to say whatever they want to say and compare us to Guns and Roses and, you know, all this stuff that, you know, they weren't into. Well, that, that you know, that's something that, again, I wasn't aware of it at the time. I was 13. I was like, this is just cool. Like, this is cool. Like the you know, the the songs are amazing, the smashing stuff up, like the look amazing. Like I I just thought like this is cool. But and but watching it now, like the editing and the and the the flow of it is really great because it really does do what you say. Like it it makes it seem so chaotic and so stressful and so like unsustainable. Like with the with the amount of like uh like pressure and, and hype and stuff. So like the fact that it ends on 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 silence and him just crawling off it's like the edit is actually like very very cinematic and like really really well put together because it 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 does sum up that entire trajectory and like that roller coaster like it, it does a really good job of it but as a kid i wasn't aware of that but it's but watching it yesterday was the first time i really noticed like that there's a proper narrative in it and it it does do a really good job of like sort of narrating that just what happened, like how you know, like the chaos that yeah. the that the, the felt, you know. And I don't want to over intellectualize it. It's just it's a fun movie, but it's like, you know, being able to look back on it now, like I, I can see the nuance in it now as well. It's pretty amazing for a bunch of like people in their mid twenties to make yeah. and be that self aware, um, especially with all the tragedy too. In in England, um, everything. Or in the UK in general, things are pretty much defined by like uh, sports teams and like fo local football teams stuff. Because everyone, everyone has, a, you know, the, the 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 towns aren't very far spread apart, and they all have like a big football team and like rivalries or rugby or whatever. 
And so that was pretty much what youth culture was, like, you know, playing sports or like, or like, you know, following sports. And so a lot of the kids who were into Nirvana were the kids who didn't play sports and who couldn't really, and who didn't care about that kind of like uh, factionalism. And that that is one of the things that's like really potent, like, because you, you know, you already feel that way. But then there's an interview with Dave Grohl where he, oh, it's Kurt and Dave, where they like specifically put a point on it, where they're just like, you know, where the kids who didn't get chosen for the football team, where the kids who like, totally, the outsiders, and you just like, it's just weird because that's that all of, all the kids who were already into it, like that's why they were into it, and so to see it summed up like explicitly like that was. Um, it's hard to say. It's hard to like express just how much like we all related to him. I, 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 and I, I think like yeah, the small town thing was part of it. As I said earlier, we didn't notice that at the time because America was this amorphous thing that we just thought like oh, it's glitzy and glamorous and like big American rock stars. But like, but it was later when I learned more about them. And it's like when we yeah, when we first started doing press, it was it was funny because we used to find that like mainly like the sort of more broadsheet press or like so sort of the older side of the of the music press they would transcribe our our interviews in our dialect you know so it would be written in our, in our dialect which made us sound stupid really and like and uh, you know it, it made it read like you were uncultured and um i think there's always been this thing in the uk that like northern well not always but at the time there was a stigma that northern bands were just sort of like you know, lads who just wanted to like, you know, like, you know, like, again, that sort of Brit pop thing, just like, you know, lads with like football chants and like, you know, getting getting drunk and having a having a sing song and all that, like which right. which was like a pretty like ugly generalization. But I, I always felt that the reason why they would transcribe you interviews like that was to 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 draw those disparities between the, you know, the differences between, you know, northern bands and like and and like london bands and 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 i realized now it's like yeah like nirvana used to talk about that like feel like they were like sort of like um typecasters like being rednecks and like every every all the press we ever did it would always mention wakefield and refer to it as being like some backwards town and like you know it's the, the inspiration for royston basie which is the league of gentlemen's town like Right. Use all these kind of like analogies to make it just sound like you were freaks, you know, like uncultured freaks who just found themselves on a record label. And it, and again, it's in some ways I'm sort of proud of that because I'm like, you know, I read the Nirvana story and they they had they had this, those same sort of frustrations like being typecast as like rednecks or whatever. But um, it was only it was probably only about ten years after Nirvana, and I think a lot of those like sort of old um I, I wouldn't say pre- prejudice is a little bit of a strong word but the, those old sort of uh stereotypes stereotypes yeah would prevailed yeah so oh gary this has been amazing i you know as somebody who you know devoured nirvana in real time and loved it and was such a fan from you know bleach onward you know they didn't put out a lot but um I feel you and I, I really love that it's it's been so heartfelt because I get that way about the things that were foundational for me. Yeah. And I, I think it's kind of amazing that something as simple as somebody being like, Hey, check this out. That's all it takes. Yeah. This, you know, just having like something peek through yeah. the window at you is just it can be that simple and or the fact that you're saving up coupons to use at a different place and waiting patiently on back order and you're like well it'll come in someday you know i think those things are foundational and i love stories like that it's the absolute opposite to now because it's like now you're inundated with everything trying to grab your attention whereas back then it was right one little thing like got through that was like it was like that was the little crack in the glass that you could use to like you know to try and get get something you know get get to the other side and where it's like now you're in on yeah. with like relentless information and the idea of having to wait for something or even having to live with something for a long time like repetitively but that was really important to me and, it, and yeah i thought it'd be i'm glad that we got to talk about it because it's like 
it's it's an interesting perspective because you know you were out here living in that world and like i was you know a a, a young teenager like just totally idealizing and, and romanticizing that world so it's like two the two different perspectives you know like like a, yeah. a, a fan who saw it all like as like some magical utopia out here and, and you like live in the reality of of, of what it was amazing time it was it was really exciting for somebody like myself who was just you know came from like again noisy punk band you know nonsense to just it was like there was this period where we're all starting to be like i think i'm gonna try to learn to write a song and then it was like nirvana just kind of like whoa like they did it way better than anyone else at the time but at the end of Every episode I ask the same question, but I tailor it to uh, the film we're talking about. So I want to ask you on a scale from one to 10, with one being the lowest and 10 being the highest, how many dives into the drum set do you give this film on a scale from one to 10 dives into the drum set? It's going to be, like, you know, it, it, it's, I'm, I'm sure like to anyone who's listening, they'll, they'll know that it's, you know, I'm going to give it 10 out of 10 because I've, I've what's lyrical about it but so it's somewhat predictable but but yeah i mean it's it it's just it's it was it was more than a movie for me it was like a you know a, it was everything it was like a, a window to the outside world it was a guidebook for like both ethics and morality in some ways and like and also like it, i have lots so many personal memories of like just not having anything like and me and my brothers just like clinging on to this kind of stuff so but like I, I see diving into drum sets as like a as almost like a negative inference because i've done it twice and it really really hurts so <laughs> well that's what i was getting at like i i know that but it is a spectacular it's just a spectacular display when it's pulled off and you don't see it that often no we, because of that fact right there reason. it hurts sucks really sucks <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, Gary. It was so good to see you. All right. Thanks, Chris. Thank you for listening to Revolutions Per Movie. We release new episodes every Thursday. And if you've enjoyed this, it would mean a lot to me if you would rate and review it on your favorite podcast app. The show is a completely independent affair. So the best way to support the show is through our Patreon at patreon.com slash revolutions per movie, where you can get weekly bonus episodes and exclusive goods sent to you just for joining. You can also follow us on social media at Revolutions Per Movie and find out more information about our various guests in the episode show notes. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week. Bye.